today on Focus with Renee Gamal, we're talking to David Itali Opati, a man with a story that transcends what happened to him. Welcome. Thank you for coming on to the show, David. Um, David, you're, you're Kenyan. Yes, I am. And um, you have an incredible story. Uh, but I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about your background before we get into your story. So where were you born? Were you born here in Kenya? Yes, I was born here in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I was born in Kenya and I lived in Uruma. And then we moved to Maringo Estate where my dad was a construction worker. Mm -hmm. So we stayed there for some time and that's where my football career began mm -hmm. at a very young age. And you started playing football at what age? As far as I can remember picking up the football and just kicking it about because I grew up in Eastlands where football was just the main thing. Your football progressed quite a little bit. Yes. And you weren't just playing in, you know, the fields. Uh, you went on to do it sort of for teams in Kenya. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, I continued playing my football as I was growing up. And I, was, I played, I started my football career with a football club called Waterworks. Mm -hmm. So that's in Kabete. And um, it was quite a good experience. And then I moved to Kangemi United. And then moving from Kangemi United, I had the opportunity now to join Kenya Commercial Bank. They were in the Premier League then. Mm -hmm. Which was, I think that was, it was a football club where it used to produce a lot of good footballers. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I uh, was signed by Tasca Football Club, mm -hmm. based in Ruaraka. But then you quit football, and you decided to do something else. What was that? I decided to quit football and join the British Army. And um, the reason why I did it was because of... When you were playing football at that time, you were not getting well paid. So that's how tough life was. Yes. Even having moved to Tasca then, the kind of salary that we were earning then, it was something good, better than nothing, but it was still not something that you could live off for a long time. Mm. So I had this opportunity where one of my friends came and told me about the British Army. So we went online in town and um, we applied online. Mm -hmm. And this is quite interesting that I will tell you. I used to drive my tattoos as well. Okay. You were a Matata driver? Yes. Uh -huh. What number? Can give me 23. 23s. So I was the type of people that I would get, um, they would tell me you'd go for squaddies. Yes. Oh, you were a squaddy? Yeah, I was oh, a squaddy driver. Oh my goodness, driver. yes. Uh -huh. yeah. At the same time, still playing football. Wow. Yeah, that the is hustle how, is real, eh? The hustle was real. And yeah. that's how we were trying to make a living. Yeah. And so when this opportunity came, I thought this was the perfect moment for me to try and get something have a new life mm. and then everything came to place I thank God for that and I ended up moving to the UK what's it like moving to another country for the first time uh, and moving to another country and into military service which you weren't in before if you recall what was that experience like for you it was scary mm. I remember the first day when I landed at Heathrow mm. at 5 a.m. in the morning and I, asked, I sat down in one of the chairs and I asked myself, what am I doing here? But you went on and uh, you joined the army. What, what battalion, what squadron, what um, part of the British army? What happens is once they select you from Kenya, you go for something called uh, pre-selection. Mm -hmm. So this is where you go for the pre-selection. Once you pass that, you end up going to the infantry school mm -hmm. where they train you for six months for you to now become a fully qualified soldier. What was your most lasting impression um, of your training period? What do you remember most about it? The friends that I made, they became brothers to me. Mm. Mm. That was the most memorable thing because as soldiers, you tend, you tend to develop brotherhood because these are people that, you know when they're training you, they're trying to put you in the situation where the reality, mm -hmm. And the reality is that one day you'll go to war. Mm. And any mistake that you make might cost your friend's life. And that is the most 
fundamental thing that they try and instill with in you every single day that when you're training. Did you ever think you would go to war? No. So when you signed up, what what did you envisage? How, how was this all going to work? Travel around the world, but in good places. Okay. Not in a hostile place. Okay. So so this was your ticket to travel around the world. Yes. How old were you? I was twenty one. You were twenty one when you went. Twenty one year old lad looking to see the world. Joined the British Army. Yes. But then things changed rather quickly, and. The traveling around the world was never going to be to all those beautiful spots. What happened? When I joined, actually, I was, uh, I was still playing football. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I was playing football for now the, the whole of British Army. Oh, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was playing football for the infantry as well. Ah. So it was quite, um, it was an amazing experience because most of the time I just used to play football. Mm. And so I can remember some of my friends calling me a tracksuit soldier. Yes, <laughs> tracksuit soldier. Yes. yes, just there to look pretty. <laughs> yeah, just there to look pretty. And um, when they said about our battalion, because when you're deploying, different regiments go during different times. Mm -hmm. And so they say to us that our battalion was to deploy in 2009, 2010 to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So now everything switches now to reality. Mm. So we had to do pre-deployment. In fact, we came to Kenya in 2008, mm -hmm. did an exercise, preparing for that, the heat, and everything. The way everything was staged was just like Afghanistan mm -hmm. in Samburu. And then from there, that's when we deployed to Afghanistan in 2009. Mm. And what part of Afghanistan were you deployed to? I was deployed to Helmand province, a part called Kajaki Dam. Mm -hmm. That's where I was deployed. Was the area that you were deployed to very dangerous to your knowledge as you were leaving at the time? I don't think during my time there, during that particular time, there was any area which was safe for any British or American soldiers. No. Mm. Every place was hostile mm. and it was hot. It was hot and hostile. Yes. Yes. You'd end up patrolling. You don't see anyone, but you'll only see a few people popping up now and then. But something funny is, every time we used to patrol, we used to have people watching. So the Taliban used to watch us. Every single thing that we are doing, uh -huh. they used to watch us. Was Were, were there villages? Were there yes, children, was, women? I never saw a woman when I was there. Wow. Because they weren't there or because they were hidden? I don't know. I can't even explain it, why yeah. I didn't see them. You're right. It does sound strange. Yes. And, and while you were there, what were you doing? Were you just stationed in the barracks? No, we used to have a patrol base, so that's where we normally go after we finish every patrol. Mm -hmm. But we used to patrol every single day. Mm -hmm. There's no day that you would go and not patrol. Only You're only given a few days when you need to have admin. This is where you clean your uniform, mm -hmm. you know, take care of your weapon, clean your weapon and stuff like that. But we used to patrol every single day. Thinking back from this 21-year-old a young footballer who has left in search of better opportunities and now you find yourself in a hot very dangerous part of the world patrolling every single day what goes through your mind as you get up to get out and go on your patrols what are you thinking about god please bring me back to the base alive mm. that is the only thing that i would think about because once you step out of those gates you don't know whether you're going to come back once you step out of those gates, you don't know whether your friend is going to come back. Once you step out of those gates, you don't know whether you're going to have life-changing injuries. Mm. So my main focus was to pray every single day, God, to take care of me and bring me back to the base. What, what's it like being in a war zone every single day? Traumatizing. Mm. That's the only one that I would find and I would use, traumatizing. Mm. Because you're thinking about so many things. You're thinking about your family that you left behind. You're thinking about the brothers and sisters you're walking through. You're walking with every single day when you're doing patrols. It's absolutely traumatizing and it's torture. Mm. Not many soldiers can say, but it is. Once everyone comes back off patrol, the relief that you see in their faces, mm. that's when you realize 
this is not this is not this is not a game video this is for this is yeah. for real yeah 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 and also because every day as you leave the gates i'd imagine you've got to seriously consider that it could be your last day yes absolutely there's no single day that you'd walk out of those gates and think that it would not be your last day and that is how i used to think and that is why i used to pray every single day that if it was my last day at least i've closed my chapter with a word of god describe that day for us so what time you got up and and what that day was like for you that day actually i woke up at about 3 a.m in the morning mm -hmm. the previous day we had a meeting with our bosses and they said we are going for patrol at this particular time and so i went to bed i prayed before i went to bed but for some reason i couldn't sleep i woke up at 3 a.m got my bible out read some scriptures put it in my bag and waited for 6 a.m the time for us to leave and something interesting was one of my friends a good friend of mine he followed my story about being a Kenyan footballer playing for Kenya Commercial Bank playing for Tasca Football Club mm -hmm. and he asked me a few questions he said where would you be if you were still playing football I said to him I don't know he was quite a very football fanatic mm. and I said to him he asked me do you ever regret leaving Kenya I said in this situation yes I do regret now mm. because you're in a war zone yes yeah you know mm. but i didn't actually realize every time he was trying to speak to me like that because he was an experienced soldier he was trying to divert my mind from thinking a lot about what's going to happen during that day mm. could he tell did he know yeah he knew i was panicking he knew i was panicking yeah he knew i was panicking mm. because i confessed to him a few times yeah. that i don't want to die mm. i've got a young family i don't want to die yeah yeah 